I do get that this is a Shakespeare movie about gnomes. <laughs> An in-depth analysis is missing the point a bit. Hello platform, I'm Emma Smith. Uh, I've written a book called This is Shakespeare. Uh, I teach and research Shakespeare at the University of Oxford. And I'm gonna be reacting to some Shakespeare adaptations. I love you. I beg your pardon? What? All right, what are you, that's just a little weird. Yeah. Okay, you know what, I can't do this anymore. That's a great ending to Twelfth Night because I think Shakespeare's play is actually a little bit cooler than that. When Viola says here, I love you, and it all ooh, do, do, that kind of music, there's a sense this is just not computable in this universe of high school football uh, and this kind of hetero heterosexual family unit watching on the bleachers and stuff. Whereas I think the play, you know, the play subtitle Twelfth Night or What You Will, I think it's a little bit more oh well, you know, maybe, uh, uh, kind of anything goes. There's quite a lot of queer desire in the, in, in the play, which seems to be being closed down here. I'm not Sebastian. I'm Viola. Wait, wait, you're not Viola. Yes, I am. The girls' team at Cornwall got cut, and the guys wouldn't let me go out for their team. So... I've been pretending to be my brother while he was in London for the past two weeks. Ow. This is really funny, I think, taking those sideburns off as if that completely transforms uh, this person from a man into a woman. But it does have a really interesting um, early modern uh, echo. Uh, some people, some historians thinking about gender in the past, think that the difference was less in a way between biological men and women and more between men with beards that means not like hipsters but men mature men uh, grown-up men adult men uh, and boys and women sort of as a, as a separate category so if there were two genders in the renaissance perhaps it was boys and women in one and adult mature men on the other so it's interesting that the facial hair although not very convincingly is playing such a good role here Tells us a lot about gender norms, doesn't it, in our own day, that Viola, to prove that she is Viola, she has to have long hair. I mean, women can have short hair. Uh, she could have cut her hair to be in the football team. But just here, to prove that really she is a proper feminine woman, she has to unloose all this long hair. It's a really stereotypical uh, sort of gendered uh, moment, like a kind of shampoo advert, isn't it, shaking out her hair. Uh, and completely different, remember, when this was performed, Shakespeare writes this for a male actor playing a woman, playing a man. So this sequence of revelations we've got here would have been very different. Just because you wear a wig doesn't prove you're a girl. Okay then. It is. Oh, merciful Jesus. All right, so everybody understand? So here, a recourse to the body. The body is what will tell us. I um, mean, that's you know, quite old fashioned in lots of ways. Even now, I think we're seeing something that's a bit dated about this movie, but it's completely different again from the Shakespearean stage. The one thing you could not do to prove that Viola was really a woman was to uh, lift up the costume because under Viola was actually a male body uh, because all actors were men. So the ending of Twelfth Night, the ending of the play Twelfth Night, particularly on the Shakespearean stage, I think is a lot more ambiguous, uh, a lot less uh, heterosexualized, if you like, a lot less straightened out. I think it's a queerer ending when what essentially happens is uh, one man, Orsino, agrees to marry another uh, Cesario in, in, in the play. Uh, there's no return of Viola in her women's clothes at the end of Shakespeare's play and that's really important to the queer dynamic of the whole thing. Yeah, I get it. Okay, wait a minute. If I kissed your brother, where is he? <laughs> He's probably halfway to China by now. He showed his Willis and Doodleberry. Present. Oh, hi. What the? Yeah. Okay, th this is freaking me out. So Sebastian looks quite like Viola in this, and that's an important uh, realist uh, kind of motif. We wouldn't kind of we wouldn't go with the story if they didn't look sufficiently alike. Uh, it's not completely true that not completely clear that that would have been the case uh, for Shakespeare. We don't know that he had actors who looked particularly alike. In fact, one of his fellow playwrights, a guy called Ben Johnson, wrote that he wouldn't write a play about twins because he couldn't cast two people who looked sufficiently alike to make it work. Uh, he may have been a bit more pedantic than Shakespeare, but it may have been that there was a great act of sort of uh, imagination needed by the audience to say, yeah, well, actually, you, you guys don't look so similar, but I just have to go with this weird dream world of the play in which people keep mistaking you one for the other. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hate to say I told you so. I think he's the only gay character in it, but I don't think he knows. But I just, ow. See, Duke, 
I didn't betray you. I'm sorry. This isn't how I wanted it to happen, and I didn't want to hurt you, but I just wanted to prove that I was good enough. I would love one of those Illyria team shirts. Extraordinary. Your story, it, it does put me in mind of another. It does? Oh, indeed, yes. There are remarkable similarities. What happens? Do they get back together, then? Get back together? Um, no, not exactly. What exactly do you mean? Well, now, it really is quite good. Whoa, whoa. She feigns her death. Whoa. He finds ah. her, thinks her dead, takes his own life. She wakes, finds him dead, takes her life, both dead. Exeunt omnes, the end curtain. Standing ovation. Bravo, bravo, author, author. That's a great moment of the Shakespeare statue talking about uh, the story of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, and it brings out lots of interesting things, actually. You wouldn't think so. Uh, I do get that this is a Shakespeare movie about gnomes uh, and that probably uh, an in-depth analysis is missing the point a bit. But it does bring out some really interesting things. The first is Romeo and Juliet uh, was always a well-known story. Uh, it did draw on these previous stories. Most of Shakespeare's plays do draw on existing stories and they riff on the familiarity people have with the story. People don't seem to have enjoyed um, great plot twists or uncertainty in their entertainment uh, when Shakespeare was writing. What they wanted to see was uh, a shape or a story arc that they already knew and they wanted to see the sort of uh, the nuances or the, the, diff the different ways that you, you could get there. So the Romeo and Juliet plot of Doomed Lovers was you know, already known quite widely through different versions of the story. Uh, but even if it wasn't, Shakespeare starts his play with this spoiler sonnet, two households both alike in dignity and forever and where, they, where we lay our scenic, scene, etc, etc, which tells us exactly uh, what's going to happen. Uh, so even if you had got to Romeo and Juliet and didn't know anything about the story, the chorus tells you exactly uh, what's going to happen. So it's within this uh, frame of uh, an awful certainty or a kind of awful inevitability. It's a really sort of interesting constraint on the play because it makes you wonder whether the characters are just kind of the pawns of fate or something, uh, star-crossed lovers as the chorus calls them. Is there anything they could have done to make this different? Is it just all written kind of beforehand? Uh, all pre preordained, predestined, and we get um, a kind of humorous take on that here. What did you say? They both die? What kind of an ending is that? My dear boy, this is a tragedy. Yeah, you're telling me, mate, it's rubbish. Rubbish. There's got to be a better ending than that. That suggestion that uh, the, the lovers ought to get back together, that that's a different story arc or an alternative story arc, I think that's one that Shakespeare's playing with uh, in uh, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, the whole setup that there are children whose parents are against their uh, marriage, uh, that's a kind of comic setup. Um, that's a rom com setup where the couple can't be together because of some external uh, obstacle or something. And we know from rom coms in our own time what they have to do is to get around that obstacle uh, and get together. And that's what we're rooting for. And there's a sense that Shakespeare mobilises that kind of expectation uh, in a way. Uh, in this play and uh, some critics have felt this is a Romeo and Juliet as a play which misses being a comedy by about you know 20 seconds or something it's uh, it's just the mismatch of the uh, of the lovers right at the end so there are two really distinct ways of seeing it one is to say this is a preordained tragedy nothing could have been different it just is and it was always going to be this way and the other is to say oh god it was so nearly there uh, if only Romeo were not so hasty about absolutely everything and just took a moment to just have a look at Juliet uh, a little bit more closely and think hmm I wonder if there's any possibility she might be just about to revive, uh, then maybe it would have been different. In the 18th century, there was a really popular run of Romeo and Juliet, which did alternate nights, tragic ending, comic ending. I think the comedy uh, seems to have been more popular. For truly, I love none. A dear happiness to women. They would else have been troubled with a pernicious suitor. I thank God and my cold blood I am of your humour for that. I had rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. What works really well here, I think, in that, in that scene between Beatrice and Benedict is casting. 
So these, uh, Emma Thompson and Kenneth Branagh, are sort of classically trained actors. They can speak this quite difficult language uh, really well and really naturally. Uh, they've got a, a, a bit of a kind of uh, chemistry between them. Uh, I think at this point when they made this film, they were married uh, off off stage uh, or off off camera, uh, so they can they can sort of play off that vibe. Because what's important about Beatrice and Benedict is that they are using this kind of bantering back and forth language as a substitute for, or in fact, a, a prelude to sex. They don't know it, or they think they don't know it, uh, but the reason they are needling each other, the reason they're talking so closely together, the reason while everybody else is bustling around, that they, they can only, they keep trying to snag the other in more and more conversation, uh, is that they actually fancy the pants off each other. God keep your ladyship still in that mind, so some gentleman or other shall scape a predestinate scratched face. <laughs> Scratching could not make it worse, and for such a face as yours were. We tend to think, and actually Beatrice and Benedict are quite well matched, they're quite equal uh, figures. Beatrice is uh, in many ways as verbally dexterous and as clever and as funny and as witty as Benedict, so she's allowed uh, to be a funny woman and a woman who uh, picks uh, a suitor and a husband who is worthy of her. But she's also shown here to be quite isolated. Uh, when we see a shot of Benedict, we see all the men behind him laughing and they're kind of part of his team. Uh, it helps that he's in a, a uniform as part of the military uh, escapades which have preceded the play. So he's part of a team uh, who, who, sh who are identified as all being on the same side. Uh, because what Much Ado About Nothing comes out to be, I think, is a, is a real uh, battle of the sexes. Uh, not primarily between Beatrice and Benedict. In fact, they're the two who manage to... Uh, in some way transcend that binary, uh, but the wider society is a completely uh, gender binary kind of world and there's a whole um, structure, patriarchal structure in this play which seems actually very mutual and reciprocal which is actually uh, I think quite a dark element of it and although this movie version doesn't really go there it gives us a hint of it just by the way it isolates Beatrice in the doorway there and gives us um, Benedict with all his mates laughing at his jokes. I know you're old. Stop! That's not my father. It's just my reflection. No. That's a great sequence. Simba has to go through this sort of nightmarish part of the uh, of, of, of vegetation and things kind of grabbing hold of him and downwards into this sort of hellish kind of place uh, to encounter uh, his dead father or his father maybe who who, who uh, isn't truly or only dead, uh, and then comes to this moment of reflection. Uh, and says disappointedly that's not that's not my father um, and one of the ways this uh, movie is such a lovely meditation actually on Hamlet uh, is that sense of the relationship between the son and the father uh, in Shakespeare's play uh, one tiny thing that's really preoccupied me is why does he give the father and the son the same name why is old Hamlet also Hamlet uh, why isn't he as he is in all Shakespeare's sources given a different name and in case we don't sort of register that, Fortinbras, the character who comes in to take over at the end of the play, he's the son of another Fortinbras as well. So it's a kind of doubled doubling. Uh, and there is some sense that uh, these are sort of both the same character or that they are somehow uh, each inside the other, that maybe we don't need to think about the ghost completely literally. Uh, but as a sense of being somehow embodied or continued uh, in the younger in, in the younger character. So you can see that there's a sort of uh, truth that what Simba comes to realise is, uh, he is he is his father, or his father is him, or he is up to that. He can live up to uh, this great um, example uh, from the past that he feels so overshadowed by. Look how... You see, 
He lives in you. So one aspect of Shakespeare's play is that uh, it's not so much about kings and princes and murders and even about ghosts, it's about mourning. It's about the completely natural and nevertheless traumatic and terrible experience almost all children will go through, which is that they have to survive the death of their parents. On the, on the one hand, that's the most natural thing in the world. You, you're the next generation, you outlive your parents. And on the other hand, uh, it's a terrible, repeated, uh, kind of drama and sorrow that people go through. So that one of the things about Hamlet that might um, mean, might explain why it's lasted uh, and been so influential and so well known is that it deals with the feelings that uh, everybody, almost everybody is going to go through at some point, the loss uh, of, a, of a parent. And here in The Lion King, the suggestion is uh, that somehow that parent is not really lost um, because you yourself, Simba himself, is the sort of living embodiment of him. Uh, now that's a comforting idea about grief and about that situation. It's actually not what happens in Hamlet, and Hamlet is not very comforting uh, about this uh, model of grief at all, I think. In fact, young Hamlet, Prince Hamlet, is pretty much destroyed by grief. He doesn't come to an acceptance uh, of what's happened, uh, and uh, his encounter with his ghost father is not this comforting, reassuring, uh, if slightly terrifying one that the lions have, uh, but instead it sets him on um, an irrevocable path actually towards his own death by saying, uh, you know, take revenge, take on this task, uh, do something about my uh, unreconciled murder. The ghost, uh, however much he might love his son, uh, actually condemns him to death. This is a nicer version of that. You must take your place in the circle of life. How can I go back? I'm not who I used to be. Remember who you are. You are my son and the one true king. Remember who you are. No, please, don't leave me. Remember who you are. I mean, that's the gift that the lion, uh, the ghost lion, gives to, gives to his son. What Hamlet's father, ghost father, says to him is, remember me. And that is a completely different instruction that pulls Shakespeare's play backwards. It stops young Hamlet from being himself and from going forward and from taking on his own destiny and thinking, you know, even going back to Wittenberg and all those things. Everything about Hamlet is impeded in the play. Uh, and that's all really, I think, down to the ghost's um, sentence, actually, which is to say, uh, think backwards, be in the past, uh, remember me, uh, try and sort out my murder, don't go forward, go backwards. Thanks for watching. We'd love to know what you think of these adaptations uh, in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more bookish videos.